Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and it seems that each year some thoughtful, creative, innovative individual writes a book that somehow captures the imagination of the Jewish community and speaks to the essence of its time, of its Jewish time. And the author becomes, appropriately, an individual everyone wants to hear and learn from. On this edition of the Chaim, I have the great privilege to introduce you to a man who has written such a book. Published in 2018, it's entitled God is in the Crowd. It is a fabulous book. Extremely well written. A page turner. Easy to read. It tells the spellbinding story of its author, an American Jew who wound up flying jet planes in the Israeli Air Force. But the book's real significance is that God is in the crowd challenges many of the traditional ways in which the Jewish community has been strategizing about the Jewish future. It's a marvelous, terrifying book, which with extraordinary honesty describes the reality of Jewish life today and the real possibility that Jewish life in the diaspora might simply fade away that American Jewry is, quote, dying in its sleep. And that the founding secular principles of the state of Israel and the secular Israelis who've fashioned a miracle of rebirth, they too will also become a relic of Jewish history. Unless, the author suggests and begs, the wisdom of the crowd will be embraced as the cure to what is eating away at Jewish life and Jewish community. It is an enormous pleasure to introduce you to a man I've been so looking forward to meeting, Tal Keenan, who is one of Israel's leading financiers, having co-founded Clarity Capital in 2005 an investment management firm with offices in Tel Aviv and in New York, with the goal of making Israel as much a global leader in financial services as the Jewish state is in the high-tech industry. Talkin is also a tireless social activist, involved with a number of major nonprofit organizations, including the Steinhardt Foundation, the Hessig Fund, and the Reut Institute. But the overarching theme of Tal Keenan's book is one that will resonate with many of you. It's the Jews' eternal search for authentic Jewish identity and what it means to be a committed Jew, committed to the Jewish people in a global world where universalistic values tend to shape much of what and who the Jew is today. It is a thrill for me to have you at this table, Kendall. Likewise. Thank, Thank you, Mark. Mazal Tov on writing a, 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 a marvelous, wonderful book. And thank you for joining me at this table. Thank you. Did I describe the book from your perspective, the point of the book, fairly accurately? I, I've been trying to put together an elevator pitch. And I might borrow that if it's OK. You're <laughs> welcome. Great. You're welcome to it. I am thrilled. OK, there's so much I want to talk to you about, but I want to begin with you, all right? Um, and one of the nice things about your book is, in some way it's written as autobiographical, and then it goes off to explain how the experiences you've, have, you've had have triggered thoughts in you, concerns in you, and then the suggestions you have for American Jewish life. But I want to begin at the beginning, and I'm going to pretend I know nothing. Okay. So you were born where? Miami. You are a Miami Jew. <laughs> Your father was Leroy? Yes. So I'm reading in a book, he was part of the Manhattan Project. That's right. 
At what point does his son realize, my father was part of the Manhattan Project? That is quite something, is it not? And boy, I hope everybody remembers the Manhattan Project was a project that created the atomic bomb during World War II. But you, what did your father do for the, for the Manhattan Project? He was on a team that uh, worked out the industrialized method of, of enriching uranium. And where was he located? Mainly in New York, but then right. set up factories in Decatur, okay. Illinois. And, yep. yeah. Many people only think it was <coughs> out in Nevada. No. But there was, a major office was in New York, and that's where your father was. That's right. And that at what point do you learn your father was in the Manhattan Project? When did you learn it? Well, that was part of the uh, story from the beginning. What, what became interesting is that the Manhattan Project is something other people know about as well. Yes. Not, not just us. Yes. Yeah. All right. Your father also dated Bess Meyerson? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Manhattan Project and Bess Meyerson, he's done. He's done. Okay. And you describe, however, the trajectory of his life. After the Manhattan Project was over, you write he had trouble yeah. finding work and doing work that really satisfied him, correct? That's right. And that was the father you grew up with. Okay. And your mother is? My mother was named? born. Tsipora. Tsipora. And lo and behold, she is not a Native American. Correct. She was born? Palestine. In Palestine. Yeah. She was born, by the way, you write, the day that Hitler invaded, invaded Poland. She grows up in, in Palestine. She's a Sabra, in essence. Mm -hmm. Okay. How do your parents meet? She was uh, doing work for a hospital in Israel after the, the, the Six Day War and was on a, a fundraising tour in, in Miami. And she meets your father. He was freshly divorced for the second time. <laughs> and, and it was very quick. Very lovely. Yeah. Okay, then you write about how, and if I overstate it, you'll correct me. Early, early in your life, there was not a lot of Jewish identity. You go to Exeter you know, one of the elite prep schools in this country. And you tell the story, Tao, that it's at Exeter that you begin to gain a Jewish identity in a non-Jewish environment. And you give your reverend at the college, at, at the school, credit. Take a moment to tell that story. So Reverend Thompson was a... Um very charismatic figure at, at Exeter and very much kind of a spiritual leader for anybody who was seeking spirituality. Um, congrega the Congregational Church was a branch of Calvinism that was very Old Testament focused. Uh, and In fact, I, you know, I, I, I don't know the history well enough to say that it emphatically embraced the Jews in, in, in kind of colonial times in, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, but I think that's probably exactly what, 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 uh, what happened. And that ethic, I think, continued to prevail. So it was somebody who's very, very versed in the Old Testament. Um, and I had an event that got me curious about, about Judaism. What was and the he event? Pulled me in. So I saw, you know, and I was 16, I hadn't really explored Judaism. I had a very basic sense of Jewish history. Um, but I saw the picture of the boy in the Warsaw Ghetto who has his hands up in, uh, in, in surrender to, to Nazi troops. You know, you have a very iconic picture from, from the war. And um, almost immediately was conscious of, of perceiving the wrong things or, 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 or gleaning the wrong things from that picture. You know, it's set up in a way that's framed in a way that begs this juxtaposition between the boy's innocence and you know, he must be seven years old or eight years old, and the Nazis' uh, uh, cruelty or barbarism or anything. And I, I, that didn't speak to me. That mm -hmm. tension, oh, you know, I, I, I understood I was supposed to perceive. I couldn't. You know, I looked at the Nazis. I couldn't muster anger or hatred or anything like that. They just looked irrelevant. And I you know, had enough of a sense of Jewish history to, to understand that every generation has that character. The uniform changes. It's, it's, it's the same person. Um, but if you look at the picture, you just Google boy in the Warsaw Ghetto, and it, it's, a, it's the first thing that comes up on images. Um, on the left side of the picture, you see the boy's family and neighbors, I think. They, they're, they're being evacuated from a building. This is the liquidation of the ghetto in 1943. And they're also in a state of kind of shocked submission. And I was furious at them. 
I, I, they had abrogated their fundamental duty, which is the, the protection of this child. And identified with the child, I, I, you know, I understood it. That they had dared to think of themselves as Poles. They were the Jews. This is what happens. This is our story. How could you not have had a contingency plan? How, how old were you at this point? 16. It's a very sophisticated feeling to have at 16. As you look back, you're now an adult. As you look back, any idea how a 16-year-old Tal Keenan could have had that thought and that insight? Guess for me. What so here's, here's a guess. A pretty Jewish-looking kid growing up in a very non-Jewish environment from age 10. I didn't start at Exeter. I started a school further for north in New Hampshire. Uh, always feeling 100% welcome. Always feeling 100% part of the crowd. That's what you felt? Always. Ne I've never experienced anti-Semitism uh, in this country. But also aware that my father hit a glass ceiling in 1946, right? Um, which is probably what ended his ambition uh, in life, right? Somebody who had achieved really tremendous success in his 20s. Um, and, and, and then all of a sudden, the war ends. He's back to being a Jew. That's something I never experienced. And I, I couldn't escape my Judaism because of the way I look. <laughs> it was a, I was always a little bit different from, uh, from everybody else. Never was, it wasn't a negative, but it was, it was, it was a difference. Uh, so I had that question lurking in my mind. What does this mean? What does it mean? And that picture gave me the wrong answer. And it's an answer I, I based the biggest decisions on my life, of my life on. Uh, but it was the wrong answer. What was the answer that you took from the picture that was wrong? Is that we are defined by anti-Semitism. That's what makes a Jew a Jew. Because I wasn't a believer then. I'm not a believer now. That's not really part of my Judaism, even today. Um, I reject that basis for identity. I understand. But you're saying that your re initial reaction was, this is a depiction of quintessential anti-Semitism. Well, so my initial reaction was uh, maybe a little more nuanced than that, in that I was angry at these parents. But it only took about two weeks to realize I'm, I'm probably as close in age to the parents as I am to the child. What's my contingency plan? I'm so upset with them for, you know, for thinking of themselves as Poles. I've only really conceived of myself as, a, as an American. What's my contingency plan? As opposed to as a Jew. As opposed to as a Jew. And you're saying to yourself, maybe I should be more cognizant of the fact that I'm a Jew. That's right. Even though I'm living in this wonderful country called America. Yes. Is this the end of Jewish history? Is America a, a new phase uh, for, for, for the Jews? Are you asking that at 16? Yes. More or less, maybe not in those terms exactly, but is, or is this just what it felt like at the ascendant part of any cycle in, in Judaism? And we were ascendant in Germany, and we were ascendant in Poland, and we were ascendant in Spain, and we were ascendant in Iraq. It ended in every single case, it ended. Um, is this new, or is this just what it felt like when we thought we were accepted? And I don't have a definitive answer today. If I had to bet, I would say it is new. I actually think it is. Um, I'm sorry, what's new? Uh, America. America is a new it's phenomenon. Different. I, I think it is. Yeah. I agree with you. I agree. Okay. Are you a junior or senior at this point? Junior. You're a junior. Okay. And you spend one more year at Exeter, and you decide to go to Israel. Why? So as, as part of my reaction to that picture, I, I did start digging in. So I started going to Reverend Thompson's Shabbat dinner uh, every Friday night, which was wonderful. And... Uh, Shabbat in itself was a, a revelation. Did he do a Jewish Shabbat yeah. or a Christian Shabbat? No, it was a Jewish Shabbat. The Reverend's doing a Jewish Shabbat. He's doing a Jewish Shabbat. It's in English. The prayers That's are recited. Okay, but there's two candles. Yeah. There's challah. There's yes. a kiddush. He's wearing a kippah. There's a kiddush. Is there a kiddush? There's Who kiddush. does the kiddush? He does. In what language? English. Interesting. You remember it as a warm experience. Very. So part of it, I think, is just coming together as community. and With other Jews? With other Jews. And that, 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 that was a big deal and it was a new thing for me. Mm -hmm. Part of it was this revelation of Shabbat, which is a mode shift. And I think it's a gift to humanity. It's not just a, uh, not just a Jewish thing. Uh, 
we, we were, I, I think, authentically commemorating it as a Jewish uh -huh. uh, event, which is appropriate. Yes. Um, however, I did go to an interfaith service a few months after my first Shabbat that was also run by Reverend Thompson. Uh, and this is maybe where the deeper questioning begins, where I, I, I was struck by, okay, that's, that's the same tone we have on Shabbat. Uh, he's using a lot of the same words when he, you know, he delivers a sermon as well on, 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 on Shabbat. Um, it's still beautiful, I, and, I, and I love it, and I appreciate it. Um, but how Jewish is the Shabbat thing? Is this, not, is this kind of Exeter religion, or is this Judaism? Good for you. And, 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 and started to dig a little bit deeper. Okay, where did the digging take you? First through the Old Testament, <laughs> which I read. Uh, and Exeter was great in that you could you know, enroll in all sorts of courses to really explore anything Judaism. So I took Hebrew, uh, I took Middle East history, I, I you know, really availed myself of everything I could, and signed up for a summer tour of Israel. Why? So, you know, Israel had always had a special plan. Mother was originally Israeli, yes. um, had had some special. Uh, she still felt for Israel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much. Yeah. Were, were in, in a secular, you know. Yes. Jew, yeah. yeah, by the way, we're talking secular Jews. Correct. Who built Israel and who still are critical to Israel. Yeah. And was your father also, did he have a Zionist bent? He ticked the box on Zionism. Yeah. If you asked him. Uh, he would say absolutely in favor, but you'd have to ask him. Okay. And when you decide to go to Israel, is your mother happy? Uh, probably mixed. Mi mixed emotions. Okay. I'm surprised that mixed. What was the negative? So I, I was teed up for the American dream in every possible way. We had, we, my family, had struggled for generations to achieve something that I was to be the first beneficiary of, right? I, the, even my father, who you know was, I didn't know the first thing about Judaism, uh, but knew he was a Jew because there were country clubs and universities and law firms that he just was not eligible for because of that. I knew none of that, and they had struggled to get me to this point, and they handed me the American dream on a silver platter, and I was turning it down. Their son who was going to get the American dream is now going to Israel. It was going to be my son, the doctor. <laughs> we, we didn't sign up for my son, the fighter pilot. <laughs> okay, so you go to Israel. I and, go to Israel. Your first experience is falling in love, love at first sight. I, what did you love? I, you know, I had been asking people that question. <laughs> my my Jewish friends, my brothers, my parents. You know, what's the contingency plan? And people looked at me like I was, God, like I was crazy. I, I understand that's not a question you really need to ask. And most American Jews obviously don't, don't ask that question. And I started feeling very original, almost kind of subversive in my thinking. And I show up in Israel and I see, you know, I've been thinking about this in a dorm room in New Hampshire. You know, it's all theoretical. Here, here are people who are, have not only had the courage to ask the question, they actually answered it, and I haven't. They are reclaiming Jewish agency. And there was a dignity in that that struck me as exactly what was absent in that photo. That, that's what, was, that's what, what grabbed me, is, is the total lack of dignity in that, in, in that photograph. And here I was, and wow, we're, and, and we're paying a high price for it, right? De defending this land costs, and we, we're very conscious of it, but we're willing to pay it. There's huge dignity in that. I was swept off my feet. I mean, I, I knew I had to be part of this. Interesting, and again, how old are you the first time you go to Israel? Se well, 17, that, that summer I'm 17. You're going into your senior year. Yeah. You come back. You finish at Exeter. Yeah. Then what do you do? I go to Georgetown. Uh, the the Foreign Service School of Georgetown had still has a, a fantastic Arabic program, and I was I was quite deep into that by, really? at that point. So I was. And I, what did you imagine you were going to do with your life at that point? I, I didn't know. I wanted to navigate my way back to Israel. I was a little bit frightened of the idea of just moving there cold. I didn't really speak Hebrew yet. I didn't know anybody. It would you know it was. It, it was you know, a, a beautiful idea, um, and the adventure of it was compelling. Uh, I didn't know even where, where to start. So I said, let, let, let me build some bridges. I, I, I should speak Hebrew. It'd be great if I spoke Arabic. I'm, I'm very curious about our neighbors, and you know, are we ever going to be able to live together? Um, so that seemed like a, a good way to do it, uh, and very quickly realized I could do a year abroad in Israel and, and kind of really immerse myself. Which I did. So my junior year of college, I went to Tel Aviv University, and 
pretty quickly realized this is it. I'm, I, I'll, I, I, I know, I'm comfortable enough now. I know how to live in Israel, um, how to pay rent, how to you know, just get by in the street. And how was your language? It was, it was okay at that point. I wouldn't say fluent. Uh, I, did, I did my first semester in, entirely in English. In the second semester, I took two classes in Hebrew. And could you handle it? I mean, I failed, but I uh, it was <laughs> good for the tribe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So your junior year abroad is over. What do you do? Uh, one of these moments of lucidity, kind of like when I was 16, where I said, okay, I, I understand that if I go back now, I, life will catch up with me. I'll, I'll end up in a track. And, and, and it'll be a great track. I'll go to law school or I'll go to Wall Street. I'll do something with the rest of my class, uh, but it won't be this. So you don't go back. So I don't go back. That was very courageous. Were your parents devastated? So that, right, that, that, was, that was, I think, the moment that maybe they were hoping that it would pass yeah, quickly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you'd yeah. get over this. Right. What did that do to your relationship to them? So, you know, I, I think my mother always had the tools to understand, even if she didn't immediately accept what I was doing. Um, this was a very foreign idea to my father, and we, we never, never reconciled uh, over that. Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you had to do it. I had to. So now you're in Israel. At what point do you join the IAF, the Israeli Air Force? So I, I applied for citizenship in my third semester. And I was pretty quick. Um, graduated from Tel Aviv. I, I took my credits from, from Georgetown. What degree? Uh, well, I'd, I'd been on an economics concentration at the Foreign Service School, but it was a, the degree was Middle East history okay. at, at Tel Aviv. Um, and almost immediately got draft papers. You chose the Air Force? No, no. I, they uh, chose you for you? Yeah, they, that's how it works. And were you happy? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, further, I didn't, I didn't, I assumed I wouldn't actually graduate. It's not, the numbers are not very good. Uh, if, it's a very hard program to pass. It's, yeah. And you write later on that the training you had to go through was almost superhuman. And at one point, you're told by your instructors, you mean, not me, you, the whole group of you told, if any of you have had it, and you want to get in the air-conditioned bus and put your feet up, we'll drive you back, I guess, to Tel Aviv, mm -hmm. and you don't have to do this anymore. Because they understood what hell you were putting, being put through. You understood what hell you were enduring, and you chose not to get on the bus. You remember that, yes? Mm -hmm. Sure. OK. Was it a hard decision no. not to get on the bus? No. Not at all. This was what you wanted. This was the full fare ticket. I wanted to pay full fare. OK. And when you get through paying the fare, you're an Israeli pilot, and then you go on how many years are you, did you serve? Eight, eight years. Full you serve eight years, yeah. right? And what planes do you fly? F-16s. Yeah, you're flying the F-16. You ultimately become an instructor, correct? Yeah. So this becomes a major part of your life at, as you're in your early years. When you are done with eight years, you're how old? 29. You're still a kid. Yeah. Although an Israeli 29-year-old is not like an American 29. Okay. I want to come back to those years, but quickly, then what happens to you? What's your journey in Israel? So I'll, I'll give you the, the high-level journey. The, yes. The, the, what's going on beneath the surface is, is the book. It, and, and that starts Already, age, right? It starts at age 29. It starts with a crisis uh, of identity at, at age 29. But By the way, you say in the book, I had spent a decade of my life ascending what turned out to be a false peak. Remember writing that? Yes. Tell the audience, what's the ascension that you went through for a decade, and why did you understand it was a false peak? In what sense, Tal, do you mean it was a false peak? So when I'm 29, I'm looking around myself and realizing I've spent the last eight years in an extremely intense environment. You know, it's an, and it doesn't end when you graduate the academy. It's, it, it's, there was no room, there was no time to question what exactly am I doing here. Uh, 
and it dawns on me very late that I don't know Israel at all. I know a tiny subset of Israel that is the aircrew community. I don't know Israelis outside of the aircrew community. Uh, I don't know Judaism at all. I've got that very, very superficial sort of Exeter uh, Judaism. And that ignorance has animated some major decisions. Not, and it's not just myself. Yeah, I put myself through a kind of a, a series of trials. That, that's fine. But the 1990s was a very combat intensive decade. I had done things I couldn't take back many times. As a pilot. As a pilot. Um, there had to be a reason. There had to be a reason. This, this started off as something like a kind of a Teach for America or, or Peace Corps um, adventure. Um, and without, without having a chance to reconsider, it had evolved into something much, much more um, consequential. Than that. Was it dark? Yeah. Yeah. Take a moment out for one second. Sure. I... I'm very impressed that I'm talking to somebody who loves Israel, loves Judaism, and is still able to say, I'm aware of the dark side. Mm -hmm. And you understand many Jews take an either-or position. Sure. You're not either-or. You're much more sophisticated, complicated, subtle, and therefore you illuminate in ways that people don't. So I ask you and Al, what's the darkness? So uh, to, to your... Uh, First of all, your framing is very Jewish, and I appreciate it. And, and we are about the nuance. We are about the gray. And Isn't that true? Let's not lose that. Yes. Let's not lose that. Yes. We've got Hillel. We've got Shammai. We recognize the notion of competing imperatives in life. That, that's always going to be the case. And I don't care what the issue is. If you're standing on the Texas-Mexico border and you can't muster compassion, your heart doesn't break for families that have been torn apart, there's something wrong with you. And at the same time, if you can't recognize that there are six billion people in the world who would like to be in America, and if they all came, there is no America, if you can't hold both of those thoughts in your mind, you're not thinking Jewishly. That, 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 that's where we are, which means perfection can never be, can never be. It should be a goal, but we, we, it's a goal that at the same time we recognize we'll never achieve, we'll never achieve. We'll always, we're, the best we can get is optima. Um, the compromises required to survive in the Middle East are brutal. They're brutal uh, on the individual. That Israelis are forced to do. Yeah. Uh, when I looked around in my late 20s, on the one hand, I looked back at three older brothers all living wonderful lives in the United States with non-Jewish children, fully American. And uh, you know now grandchildren who are not Jewish uh, or completely not Jewish, uh, and wonderful and happy and I love them and it's great. I'm looking back at that though and becoming increasingly convinced that Americanism is an option, in a way that being Polish or German never was. If you reach the same conclusion th that I reached at the time, that America is truly an option then the next question has to be, what exactly are we fighting for here? We're dying and we're killing. We're talking about in Israel? In Israel. Uh, there has to be a Jewish reason for this. Otherwise, let's pack up and, and, and leave. Israel. 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 And Judaism. Let's leave Judaism. You know, I, again, I, I, as I'm not a person of faith. I'd love to be, but that's just not, I don't think it's a choice. <laughs> and uh, It's never been available to me. Um, okay, just so you and I understand each other, I want to make sure the audience understands. What you mean is you do not believe in a personal God. I don't believe in a man with a beard looking down and watching what I eat. That's not fair. Judaism never believed in that God. I'm saying something more profound about you. However you live your life at the moment, it is not in relationship to what you believe in God. There is a God who wants X, Y, and Z of you, correct? Not in a kind of anthropomorphic notion. Correct. It's a very oh. Maimonidean notion of God yes. that I have. Yeah. Okay. By the way, I, I, you know, I just adore you. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> what you've said is so Jewish. You know, I had a professor who once told me, tell me what God you, you don't believe in. I'll show you how <laughs> Jews never believed in that God. 
And the Maimonidean model is what I believe is infused throughout Talmudic literature. And I'm off topic for one moment, but I'll say this to you just to see how you react to it. I've come to understand there are two strains of even Jewish theology, Jewish philosophy and thought. There is a Jewish a human understanding that inside the human being there are emotions which in some way one can't deny and one shouldn't pretend don't exist. They have nothing to do with intellect, nothing to do with reason. They're just plain, you live in life and sometimes things frighten you. And sometimes you're smart enough to understand there's not a thing in the world you can do about it. And at that point, you want to say, for lack of a better phrase, God help me. There should be something in this universe that will save and interfere and interrupt. And there's an entire piece of Judaism that is folklore. And the folklore has a real place in Jewish life. It need not be dismissed. But the folklore is meant to be folklore. And there's a broader context of which the entire Talmudic, rabbinic uh, uh, philosophy embraces. And it says, while we will tolerate the folklore, there's something overarching. And it's how you really live in this life and understand what it means from a Mandian perspective. There's no God with a hand and an arm and a back. In fact, you're forbidden in Judaism mm -hmm. to believe in a God with, with an arm and a full, and there is no God with a face. And you can't ever prove God, which is the Jewish genius, you will never make a picture of God. Yeah. Seeing is believing, fine, then you'll never see. And what you'll do is you'll experience. Every now and then the, Jewish, the Jew experiences something profound, which Maimonides says is that moment of lightning where for an instant, just an instant, you see everything and it's gone. And the only difference between you and me and the prophets is the prophets had that moment more often. And the, the challenge of life is to live in between those moments. So when you say you have a Maimonidean understanding of God, you, to me, you say what I wish every Jew understood. At the same time I'm saying to you, I don't, I don't denigrate, I don't make fun of any God, any individual who at the same time needs the folklore. Mm -hmm. I only demand they understand, <clears throat> that they acknowledge it's folklore. It isn't that that's the reality of life. So can I try to convince you that you don't need to demand that of them? I, I, I look at faith is not, a, not, not, not an essential Jewish, I mean, it's a very Christian notion faith and it's 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 essential to christianity you can't really be a good christian without faith i think uh not true for judaism at all um however faith does have a role because we all come at this a little bit differently we've been very practical i think in the way we we, we organize ourselves and, and in, in what we demand of ourselves i've been thinking in terms of a factory that makes circles how do we get on the same page, right? L let's say that our objective is to create circles. A customer can come in, he gives us a radius, we'll make a circle the size that he, he ordered. Um, you and I can work in the same factory even if we come with a different, different approach to how this is done. So we can say, all right, we have the radius, what we need now is a point to draw the circle around. I can come with the conviction that it doesn't matter where you put that point, it's going to be the same circle. Put it on the wall, on the ceiling, on the floor, it doesn't matter. Um, you could be very different in your approach, saying it's, it's, it, for this to be a kosher circle, that point has to be in the middle of this wall. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's not kosher. We could still work together. Let's put the point where you want it, because I don't care, and you do care. What does that require, though? Fundamental love. Love. It, it doesn't work without love we need to be able to accommodate the following. You're looking at me and understanding that I see you as crazy, crazy that you think it's gotta be in that wall. But I'll, I love you and we, I'll go with it. I need to recognize that you're looking at me as a heretic, uh, but you still love me and we can still work together. I hope so. 
And I think that, 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 that's fundamental. We don't need to convince each other of that underlying fundamental truth. It's OK. It's OK that that remain personal. What we need is a common map, not a common destination. We can be going to different places, but let's be looking at the same map, because there, there, there's so much value in the map. There's so much wisdom in the map. We can see, by the way, the darkness and the light. We can see where the reefs are that are going to be dangerous, where the sailing is, is likely to be more smooth. We can still be going to very different places, but, but we should have a same map, uh, uh, a map between us. And, and that, that, that's very fundamental to crowd wisdom as well, which I think is, is, is the essential Jewish governance mechanism. Namely? So the, the wisdom of crowds is, in Aryan mathematics, and ba basically the manifestation that, that I think mo most people are familiar with is if you see these contests, where you've got to guess the number of uh, jelly beans in a jar. And the, the kunz in that is, is not figuring out who's the best at guessing the number of jelly beans. And there are people who are consistently good at that, and people who are consistently bad at that. that it is a skill. Um, the revelation is that if you have enough people guessing and you just take a simple average of their guesses, it will typically be much closer to the actual number of jelly beans in the jar than the best guess in the entire crowd, uh, which is a profound, profound and very counterintuitive notion. Um, even more than that, if you have a crowd of experts, if you kind of you do this a bunch of times, which we have, <laughs> Um, and pick the best people and have a sample that's just them, 100 great guessers versus 100 people who are you know, some great guessers, some average guessers, some lousy guessers. It's the second group that will typically do better. Meaning, Namely, even if we have, you know, not the experts. Not just experts. You, want, you want some experts, not all yeah. experts. Okay. So I'm going to connect it both to the Jewish people and to God. And to a notion of God that, that, that can work, I think, for, for everybody, at least as a sort of a lowest common denominator uh, definition. For the Jewish people, so f first of all, crowd wisdom doesn't, um, just being a crowd doesn't make you wise. Right? Most crowds are not wise. Uh, that it's a very narrow subset of, of crowds. And there are certain preconditions that have to be in place in order for, for crowds to be wise. And you can see this in financial markets all the time, which function as a crowd, um, trying to divine some truth and often mustering intelligence that no individual participant has, and offering mustering stupidity that no individual participant has. So, so there's it, kind of an in, interesting dynamic happening here. When I look at Judaism for the last 1,900 years, we went from condition, a condition of sovereignty in our own land um, with a governance structure that was not dissimilar to others around us, um, other, uh, other peoples, to being scattered uh, across the earth with nobody officiating over our evolution in a very complex orthodoxy already then that was going to become much more complex and evolve considerably uh, over the generations. Very little coordination between the communities. You know, if you were in uh, Warsaw and I was in Rabat, we, we, we probably didn't know about each other. We certainly didn't know each other for, for most of that period of, of diaspora. And we were evolving. And there was no pope to adjudicate, OK, your evolution's right, and his evolution's not right. Um, no, we had to work that out ourselves. What are the odds that there'd be a coherent identity called Jew 1,800 years after that event? I, I would have bet against it. That doesn't make sense to me. Uh, so I, I posit that there has been a governance mechanism in, in place for that period. And it is a derivative of, 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 of the wisdom of crowds. This is what has kept us together. This is how we've navigated. Um, as a stand-in for God, I think it's pretty cool because it is a higher intelligence. It absolutely is. That doesn't require faith. Now, that doesn't have to be enough for you. That's OK. If you, if you, if, if you, you have a real belief in this anthropomorphic being, that's OK. We're, we're back to the circle factor. We can still work together. It's OK. But let's have some fundamental notion, some rallying point, some point that we can all draw a, a circle around. Otherwise, it, it's what is this? What are we doing? That's the challenge of our generations right now. OK. I have a distinct feeling that when you were done with your service with the IAF, there were things that you regretted having done. Mm -hmm. I do want to hear what this 28, 29-year-old felt was the darkness okay. that he had to live through. And how do you deal with that 
after it's over. Right. Okay, so I, I, I understand what you're asking now. Uh, this, this is the trolley problem. Um, might be worth 30 seconds to go on the, to the right, introduce the trolley problem. Please right? do. A kind of a behavioral experiment where you, uh, you imagine yourself the uh, attendant at a train relay station. And there's two tracks. There is a person tied to the track that the train is, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> there are five people tied to the track that the, the, the train is headed for. They'll all die if the train continues in that direction. You can pull a lever and route the train to another track where there's one person tied, um, should you pull the lever. And most respondents say yes. And, and it's a utilitarian argument, right? We, we are saving five lives. We are sacrificing one, but better than saving one life and sacrificing five. Um, the problem gets much more complicated if you change the framing a little bit, where you have one track and a bridge over the track uh, five people still tied to the track, but somebody who's looking over uh, f from the bridge, and you can push that person over the edge. He'll land on the tracks. He'll definitely die, but the five will definitely be saved. And here the results are reversed. People, f far more people are unwilling to do that um, uh, than they are to take action in the first, even though the result is, is exactly the same. War is a, a tyranny of trade-offs. Uh, that you, you can't avoid, you cannot avoid. Especially the kind of wars that we're fighting today in the Middle East where the, without judging the ethical code of the different protagonists, they are incompatible, they're totally different. Uh, what, are, what are totally <clears throat> incompatible? The, you know, there's the Hamas slogan that we, we embrace death as much as the Jews embrace life, that's real. That's something that's really happening. And I say this as a peacenik in, in Israel. I'm on the, you know, the dovish side of the Israeli political spectrum. But, but this is a reality that it doesn't serve anybody uh, to, to deny it. Uh, the number of times that we have been fighting to save the lives of Palestinian children that their government is trying to sacrifice actively, trying to get us to kill them. Um, by shooting at our children from behind their children. That's exactly what's happening and still happening today. Uh, imposes a version of the trolley problem on us, the operators. And I think very much in that when you're a little bit removed from the problem, pulling the lever seems easy. It's the only, it's the only good decision uh, to, to be made here. You're saving five lives. How could you not do that? When it's your finger on the trigger, uh, it can be very different. It can be very different. Um, and it's messy. And there's a huge sacrifice here. There's a huge sacrifice. Even if you come home physically intact, um, most of us are not completely emotionally intact. And ever, that, that never heals. That's, um, and I think for the foreseeable future, this is going to be the price of Jewish sovereignty. If we want this, we're gonna have to continue paying this price and sacrificing our children in the same way. Yes. Asking them to do what you had to do. Yes. Which is to basically pull the trigger in order to save more lives. Yeah. And the horrible human dilemma of taking a life for any reason. And yet, you know, you, we talked about Jewish values a moment ago. In the Jewish tradition, there's no question what you do. You save the five lives. You remember the, the story that you write in the book about when you felt you failed mm -hmm. on a mission. Yeah. Can you tell that very briefly? Uh, the, the background is, is actually a, a newspaper report I, I read as a, a, the result of w one of these missions. And, and the issue is collateral, what we call in America collateral, collateral damage, uh, right? Is, is, is unintentionally harming civilians in, in, in the prosecution of a war. Basically, you couldn't see well and you dropped bombs <clears throat> where you didn't mean to bo drop bombs. Correct. And you realized you were killing civilians where it sounded as if the ethic of the IAF was you do everything to, possible to avoid. You're a, you're a commanding pilot at that point. Yeah. You're the lead pilot. And you're doing your best and you describe how the weather is horrible and you 
you've been delayed, 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 but you have to do it by a certain time or else you can't get back to the base. And finally, you, you dive and you do it, and it turns out that you realize afterward you were in the wrong spot. Do I have it basically right? Yes. Okay. And it, you are so upset that this happened, even though it wasn't intentional on your part. You were doing the best you could. And when I read that passage, I felt for you, and I also didn't feel you were being critical of your, you were upset with that it happened, but that I, I didn't feel you were upset with the ethic of the IAF. Is that fair? Yeah, it is fair. Uh, so I, I write it, and, and it's not a unanimous opinion, right? It, we, it, Meaning? So at, at, at that time, it was more or less the same time that that, uh, that, 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 that strike uh, happened. We were doing this a lot. And one, one, of those, one of those operations led to nine civilian deaths. Um, and a big uproar, uh, kind of a, a, a really kind of a defining event for Israeli society. Um, where you know, I think you know, it's 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 television, and everything was kind of just becoming much more close. Uh, you you could see much more of what was actually uh, happening, uh, and I don't think we had gone through that calculus in a you know in, in a clear enough way. And uh, 27 of us quit, uh, stopped flight duty, and, and issued a, a public letter to you know, to our government. Um, I, I didn't agree with them. 28 of your colleagues quit. 27. 27. You did not. No. And you thought they were wrong. I did. I again. I. You understood them very well. But you thought they were wrong, because. Because I I couldn't see and I still can't see a practical alternative. What are you supposed to do? What should you do? Uh, you know, somebody to be clear. It's their kids, who will die, if we don't defend ourselves. Somebody has to do it. Um, it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be clean. We'll make mistakes. We'll occasionally do worse than mistakes. You know, okay, again, war pulls out the worst in us and the best, but also the worst. Uh, sometimes it won't be a mistake. In, in my case, you know, I, it was, um, but that's not, always, that's not always how it goes down. It's very important I ask you this, Tal. If you had to guess your best instinct, what percentage of the mistakes are just tragic mistakes, what percent are because somebody just lost it and did something that both of us would be very, very critical of? Almost 100%. The former. Genuine mistakes. Okay. Almost 100%. And therefore, is it, is it, are you comfortable with my saying that from your perspective as you write and as you speak, while you're said by what war makes even righteous people do. On balance, you are proud of the ethic of the IDF in general, the IAF in particular. Is that fair? Extremely. Uh, I think it's actually unique, and, and I have basis for comparison. Okay. I want to jump to something you wrote at the very end of your book. It's the one thing I could not understand what your point was. Why did Tal Keenan put this into the book? Near the end of the book, you, you do your whole story. You're a successful entrepreneur now, financier in Israel. You deal with Palestinians all the time. You're one of the few Israelis who's dealing with Palestinians. Hopefully we'll get to talk about that. But the passage I'm talking about is you're going from the West Bank you're leaving the West Bank, and you have to go through a checkpoint. Mm -hmm. And you come to a checkpoint with a Palestinian friend. And you come to kids who are Israeli soldiers at the checkpoint. And in essence, they're just sort of callous and obnoxious, and they make you wait. It's very hot. And they make you wait at this checkpoint when they could have waved you through. They make you wait. It's not clear even why they make you wait. And at one point, you're watching them, and they're just taking a smoke. And they're laughing. And in the end, a f one, of the, the, one, of the female, one of the female soldier comes over to you and says, oh, you're still here? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Which she could have said half hour, 45 minutes ago. You're thinking to yourself during this moment, 
I've got my IAF credentials with me. I could go up to them, and I'm an officer. I could give them hell. I could create real problems for them and teach them a lesson. And in the end, you don't. You write it because you did not want to do this in front of your Palestinian friend who says something very, not comforting, but he, he says something to make you feel better as if it's not so bad, but you know it was horrible for him as it was for you. And that's the story. And I'm reading this story and I'm saying, why did Tal put this in the book? I don't believe you think this is indicative of who the IDF is. Mm -hmm. it, was not a, it was not an event that illustrated some larger point you wanted to make. On the contrary, you're very proud of the IDF. So why did I have to read that story? So I, I share your concern that that story gets misinterpreted. And um, by the way, e even my mission can be misinterpreted and, and probably has been. That's okay. Um, it, it's a price that I'm, I'm willing to pay to make the following points. What is the cost and what is the benefit of Jewish sovereignty? This is a question for all Jews, we need, we, and we need to answer it honestly. It doesn't matter how enlightened your policy is. If it's enacted by 18 and 19-year-olds, it's going to be distorted. That's, that's going to happen. Remember the Stan Stanford Prison Guard experiment from the, from the 50s? Um, we will, we're human beings, just like everybody else. Uh, put too much power in our hands, we will end up abusing it, just like everybody else. That's life, right? It's Milai, it's Abu Ghraib, it's that checkpoint. Yes, Milai and Abu Ghraib were uh, obviously much, much more egregious. Abusing power, the, even benignly, the way this young lady did uh, at the checkpoint, that, that's something that's happening a lot. I want to percent. Here, here's a, uh, an example, which this fellow, Elor Azalia, the, the guy who, who killed the terrorist who had stabbed his, uh, his, his French soldier in, in Hebron about three years ago in Israel. Uh, the terrorist had stabbed somebody, was shot, was now wounded on the ground, probably going to die, uh, and he shot him in the head, went to jail. A huge debate in Israeli society. Is this a you know, scourge, a kind of a stain on, on, on the, the ethic of purity of arms in the IDF? Or is this what we call, the, a lot of people in Israel call them the Ayelet all of our, all, all, all of our children. All, the, the child of all of us, um, meaning understand the kid. What was missing from the debate, and this is something that I think is Jewishly toxic in Israeli society, is what exactly are the circumstances that we're thrusting our 18 and 19 year olds into that is resulting in this type of behavior, even if it's rare, and it is rare, I, I agree, even if it's rare. There's an environment that is costing us a, a lot, and we need to constantly be aware of, of what price we're asking our, our, our young people to, to bear and what is the benefit that accrues to them. And I argue that the that calculus is, is becoming very difficult to justify for a lot of Israelis, and people are leaving, and this w w will not sustain itself. We need to be very, very emphatic about what the deal is. What are we offering? What, what is the benefit? And what is the cost that we're, we're imposing? Um, that's why I talk about those things in the book. I think it's a, it's a critical Jewish question. It's an important question for American Jews to understand that we are asking Israeli Jews to do that. You know, I. Uh, I had dinner with a friend from the squadron and his wife who, who lives here. She made a comment that she doesn't want their kids going back to serve um, in, in the Army. And these are two, you know, he's a pilot in the Air Force, she is an intelligence officer, great people, really great people, the kind of people you want in a foxhole with you. They're great. Um, so I hear that sort of thing a lot, and it, it's disturbing to me, and it's not new, I understand it. Um, so I asked her, tell, tell me why. And when you're looking at it from here, it's very different from looking at it from Tel Aviv. Uh, you are looking at costs and benefits. And her answer was two things which we should all be very, very conscious that this exists. Number one, I don't want my kid coming home with a scratch on his body or on his psyche in defense of the theocracy that is uh, emerging in Israel. I, I don't want to defend that. I don't want to pay anything for that, certainly not my son. 
number one. Number two, our neighbors in Palo Alto, also Jewish, the only thing that differentiates between us is their grandparents got on one boat in Poland and my grandparents got on another boat in Poland. And I reject the notion that that means that his son should get to go to Stanford while mine has to go serve at a checkpoint. I, that's not a deal I'm willing to embrace. I have my green card. I'm going to have citizenship uh, ultimately in this country. I don't have to take that deal, and I'm not taking that deal. This, this is a view that exists in Israel. It's not mine. I'm not trying to justify that position, but I certainly understand it. And it's something that we, we need to ask as a Jewish community in Israel, in the United States, what exactly are the costs that we're asking and who are we asking uh, uh, bear those costs and what are the benefits that, that, that accrue to us? I think there are really good answers to those questions, but we're not asking the questions yet. There, for, so there, there's a fundamental ethical question that that, that that raises, but there's also a practical question, which is if we're going to go extinct in this country, it's the, in the United States, it's the best way to go extinct. I call it dying in our sleep. We'll just marry <laughs> ourselves into it. It'll be love, no gas chambers. This is, this is a good way to... Uh, in Israel, what I think happens if we don't answer these, these fundamental questions, um, which we're not doing today, we're not even posing them today, is you have, your framing is good for an outsider. It's good if you're trying to explain the dilemmas of, of, of ethical defense in, in Israel to an outsider. The insider's framing is different. How? We're not all doing that. We're not all sharing that burden. Just as my friend's wife resents the notion that the American Jew feels entitled to a different fate yes. because of the boat yes. that his grandparents got on. We have large populations in Israel who are also not part of the deal. They're not bearing that cost. And that's part one of my meeting with Tal Keenan, author of a superb book on the challenges facing our Jewish future entitled God is in the Crowd published by Penguin Random House, and of course available in bookstores and through Amazon. And I hope you'll be with us for part two of our meeting here on L'Chaim. Of course, I'd love to hear any reactions you may have to any of the ideas expressed by Tal Keenan on this edition of L'Chaim. Please email me, write me, post it on our Facebook page, or tweet me. I look forward to reading your reactions to Tal Keenan's look into the Jewish future. And remember, you can now listen to the L'Chaim podcast on iTunes or Google Play or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'Chaim, my friends, to life. Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax deductible gift of $36, double high or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.